but you are showing the way against China's autocrat. You have been adamantly doing the best thing to do in this formidable annual meeting of yours. You bring everyone together in the largest possible front of free peoples so that the bosses of the regime face an opposition that is a rainbow of all ethnicities, sects, nationalities, and you refuse to be dictated to by the dictator and are successful, and you are successful standing up to his ugly page, which is to victimize so-called minorities, which it can then separate from other groups, just for him, the Chinese autocrat, to remain in power. <coughs> Please stay the course and teach us in the Middle East how to stay the course. The vast rainbow of free peoples is our departing point, and we are grateful to you for that. Is more needed beyond the constant show of unity of Democrats across the rainbow against the dictator? I'm not sure. Can one do more than what you're doing? I'm not certain. But it may be useful to be more specific about the shape of China to come in the same way as you have been struggling to lessen the dominance of sectarianism in our Middle Eastern societies. Let me end this aspect of the sectarian ethnic challenge with two areas drawn from my personal experience. One is political, the other is international and media. The first I call the color of freedom. Sectarianism cannot be easily overcome, especially because the autocrat exacerbates it. If I, victim, if I victimize you as Uyghur or Tibetan or Muslim or woman, it is only human to react as Uyghur, Tibetan, Muslim, and woman. The Rainbow Coalition helps transcend this natural reaction by fighting in one's soul against the ploy of the dictator to elicit the worst from you, to dictate his own page on your very soul. But the Rainbow Coalition is more effective when, within it, a convergence of souls gets expressed in a political format that lessens the colors to the outside by unifying them into one color, the color of freedom. Does that require a political party? Maybe, probably not. We are testing together new territory. One where the rainbow is also monocolored by freedom. From my own small experience in trying to break the straight jacket of sectarianism in my tiny native Lebanon, I can tell you that in my presidential campaign to end the dictatorship back in 2005-06, the picture that I particularly like shows the small team that naturally came together to support me in the campaign. Here's the picture. Right, so you can't see very well, and it doesn't really matter. This is a small group of people who were at the core of my campaign in Beirut. There was one also in New York and in various other places. But if you look uh, just generally at this picture, you will note the immediate diversity of gender and age group. And here in the second picture, appear all the supporters at the press conference during the campaign. One of them, the one on the left, whom we cherished, was then 95, Dr. Albert Sara, who died recently. So a closer look at these pictures will show that all the major sects found in Lebanon, those that are supposedly on the conflicting side of the sectarian barrier, are representing the picture. We even have in the former one a young Syrian man. It's the young Syrian man in this fight. So if you go back to the previous picture, then yeah. So the guy, the young man at the front, you can see him with the tie. His name is Shakib Al Jabri, and he's one of the most extraordinary resistance to Syrian domination in the current revolution. In Syria. He was part of this campaign. 
So, I think that this is how sectarianism is naturally, effortlessly defeated when the message is right. You see, all these people came on a their own accord. I started the campaign, and they started calling me and said, I want to help. And then they came together, and we had this huge movement in Lebanon and across the Middle East and in the world, saying, the dictator must go down. Well, these people, I didn't contact any of them. They came naturally. And when they assembled, I realized that they covered the whole spectrum of the differences in Lebanon. And I can tell you that. So I think you don't need a lot of effort to defeat sectarianism or ethnicity if your message is right. It will come together naturally. It transforms naturally into an all-encompassing group where people no longer see themselves other than citizens. So in the light of this extraordinary array of leaders assembled here, assembled here, thanks Dr. Young, around nonviolence, freedom and equality, our message should be ambitious. Maybe you should start considering transforming this impressive coalition into an oppositional front, even perhaps an oppositional government. Overnight, such a transformation puts you so much higher on the map of the Chinese dictatorship. You will represent for all the world the face of the future and the worst nightmare of the autocrat who fears you enough already, but can fear you even more. The battle is no longer a free Lhasa for the Tibetans, or a free Urumqi for the Uyghurs, but a free Beijing for all. Beijing free, the rest will follow. Urumqi or Lhasa free without the free Beijing is in an incessant, continuous nightmare. We have a counterexample from the 2011 Middle East Revolution. As our revolution, our nonviolent revolution, raged to free Sana'a, Tunis, Damascus, and Cairo, South Sudan became a new state, while Khartoum in the north remained in the grips of the dictator. The two countries, two former countries today, with their seats separate at the UN, the two countries, Sudan and South Sudan, are at open war as we speak, and only the fall of the autocrat in Khartoum will give the peoples on both sides of the new barrier a chance to finally be free. This is not to say that the specificity of Tibet, of Xinjiang, should be obliterated or forgotten. Quite the contrary. My argument from the Middle East Nonviolent Revolution is that ending the dictatorship at the center is the condition for any paradigmatic change for freedom across the span of his autocratic rule. The end of the dictator at the center is only the beginning of a new world of freedom for all his victims. For Tibet to fully bloom, for Xinjiang to fully bloom, far more work needs to be done. And let me suggest, from my experience in Iraq, the difficulties for freedom to be institutionalized when groups and ethnicities retain, as they are naturally want to, their color in the last frame. <coughs> now let's push this legal argument a bit further on the shape of things to come after Beijing is free. The word federalism is still taboo in many of our countries, from China to Mauritania. But federalism is a unique discovery of the late 18th century constitutional thought that saved America from what used to be known as factions. I, as a lawyer, am an advocate of federalism, which, as a Middle Eastern taboo, was broken for the first time in a meeting of the Iraqi opposition to Saddam Hussein that I helped organize in London in the spring of 1992. This is at that conference. This is when, for the first time, Shias and Kurds came together on the general delineation of the future of Iraq as a federal state. This, a decade and a half later, was inscribed in their constitution. The constitution of Iraq is the only federal constitution in the Middle East. 
And I was in Baghdad in 2009 and 2010, working for constitutional review, working with and for the constitutional review committee for the completion of an incomplete federalism in the first Saddam fragile path of democracy. Federalism is not easy to establish in a country where ethnicities and sects are diverse. I'm now convinced that a new political order, one that is not quite the territorial federalism known in Western constitutions, needs to be conceived anew for our countries. For the Middle East, certainly, perhaps for China. You might want to examine this further. This is hard work and an immense challenge because Western-dominated comparative constitutionalism has not quite figured it out other than in territorial terms. Perhaps territorial federalism works well for Xinjiang and Tibet, you know better. Maybe something more is needed, including full independence. The more attention you devote to the problem, the more open scholarly and less scholarly discussions you carry out here and in China, the better the solution comes when freedom invests by G. But please do not lose the forest for the trees. Free Beijing is the condition for free Lhasa and for free Burundi. Let me now turn to another challenge, which I see actually as an even greater success than the Rainbow Coalition achieved in this extraordinary conference. This is the challenge of making nonviolence successful. It has been partly successful already. This is why Moscow and Beijing are terrorized. For they saw Zain al-Abidin, they saw Mubarak collapse in the non-violent Tunisian and Egyptian tide in just a few weeks. Moscow and Beijing autocrats are terrorized by the extraordinary, determined pursuit of non-violence in Syria and in Bahrain. Yes, indeed, Syria has turned non-violent. Note that Bahrain hasn't. And we continue to work for Syrian revolutionaries reclaiming the high ground of nonviolence in their fight against Bashar al-Assad. We may even be succeeding, despite the poor showing of Kofi Annan putting at moral equivalence the monster who rules Damascus and his innocent pure victims. With a group of colleagues, including Dr. Yang, we have put a program forward for Syria, and we are discussing it with the Syrian opposition in the person of Dr. Sadiq Jalal Azam and his wife, Iman Shakir, who helped us pin this program down, and with the larger leadership. We are engaged with the highest level leadership in Syria, in the opposition, to make this program of nonviolence regain the high ground. We are discussing it also with the leaders of Congress, with the State Department, and with friends across the Middle East and Europe, and we are confident that much of it can be inscribed in the immediate future of Syria. Ladies and gentlemen, because of the signature, including Dr. Young, this plan was also conceived as a blueprint for Bahrain and for China and Russia from the point of view of international law. You see, it is no coincidence that the duo Putin Medvedev and the duo Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao have been so heavily invested in the defense of Assad's regime. It is not about oil or trade or contracts. A new government in Damascus would have no problem trading with China and Russia. And the military basis for Russia in Syria is meaningless in any case for what would Russian soldiers be fighting in the Mediterranean. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is not trade. It is not oil. It's not old-style geostrategy. It is the terror in Beijing and Moscow of the Damascus nonviolent revolution being successful, creating a life precedent from Moscow to Beijing. 